Take some. 1998 and 1999, what a year for first person shooters. 1998 saw the release of Half-Life, Sin and Turok 2 and 1999 saw the release of Alien vs Predator, System Shock 2 and Quake 3 Arena. As a teenager with very little to do in my spare time, I mean it was awesome. And on top of that, in the movies we also got Fight Club and The Matrix, which my mate and I saw three times in a single weekend. One of the other games to also drop in 1999 was Kingpin Life of Crime, a violent, mature-themed shooter developed by Yatrix Entertainment. It was all a commotion. The same guys who made Redneck Rampage and returned to Castle Wolfenstein would eventually go on to become Treyarch, the developers who created countless entries in the Call of Duty series. Kingpin was a pretty unique game though and it got a lot of controversy at the time for its violence and profanity. Also of note was that it had a soundtrack by Cypress Hill. The way I first found out about this game was when this edgy kid at my high school brought it into class one day to show off the manual. Yeah, back in the day when a game manual was a game manual, like you could go and empty your ass and learn how to play the game at the same time. It's definitely one of those hidden gem kind of titles that you just don't hear people talking about all that much. I'm even a bit guilty of that myself, I mean I did a video on it a few years back but then I just kind of forgot about it. That is until 3D Realms announced they're going to be working on their very own remaster called Kingpin Reloaded. Someone had to. I guess Night Dive Studios are busy with the System Shock remake. Anyway, someone up the story in this one is pretty simple. You're a nameless criminal who's beaten up and left for dead by a couple of gangsters in a fictional part of a city called Skid Row. You survive, however, with nothing but a metal pipe and a thirst for vengeance, and you head off and hunt down your old boss, the Kingpin himself. If the main character's voice sounds familiar, well, it ought to. This guy's name is Drew Markham, and aside from being the director of the whole project, he also did a few voices for the Nazis in Return to Castle Wolfenstein, and even Bubba in Redneck Rampage. Son of a bitch got away. This boat leaves for the X-Labs within the hour, torpedoes or not. He's that understood, Major. One of the most obvious things you're going to pick up on, as soon as the intro cinematic starts, aside from the profanity, is the abundant references to Pulp Fiction. The main bad guy in the game, who I don't even think is given a name aside from just being called the Kingpin, is pretty much just Marcellus Wallace from Pulp Fiction. Now listen up. And a lot of the other characters make references to the film throughout these cinematics as well. There's some lines that are almost copied across verbatim. I'm prepared to scour the earth for this motherfucker. I'm prepared to scour the earth for that motherfucker. Every second word out of someone's mouth is usually an F-bomb, which was cool back then when I thought that boobs and skateboarding were the most important things in life, but nowadays it just comes off as laughable. Still, it does make for a unique story and a setting, and they don't hide the fact that you're playing as someone who's not really a boy scout. To put it simply, your character is a bit of a dickbag, and you'll see that very early on firsthand. It was my $20. Hey, hold on a second, man. Piece of shit. He's completely lacking any kind of moral compass whatsoever, and right from the get-go, you're free to just kill anyone you want to, with pretty much no repercussions. Unless they're mission critical, in which case it's a game over. Now this is not a standard run and gun shooter, at least not first anyway. The environments in Kingpin are split up by the various districts of this fictional city where the game takes place. And each area has a bunch of NPCs, some just bystanders and other that are hostile gang members. It was happening. A lot of these enemies are really smart too. They've got really good pathfinding so they can stalk you easily. They'll run off when they're injured and this also applies to friendly NPCs who help you out too. This is actually one of the more impressive aspects of Kingpin, is just how good the artificial intelligence is. The way these dudes are able to follow you up ladders, jumping across ledges and all that kind of stuff, was really ahead of its time, considering in something like Half-Life, they'd often get stuck on a doorway or a staircase. You're gonna need their help too, because there's a lot of people in this game who want you dead. I mean, even the rats in this game attack you. The art direction and the level design in this game was worked on by a dude named Viktor Antonov, which might not mean that much or sound familiar, but this guy'd later go on to work on Half-Life 2, Dishonored, and even the Wolfenstein games. A lot like Half-Life 2, Kingpin is a game that takes place in a world that feels realistic. You're moving through back alleys and dodgy streets. There's graffiti on the walls, there's neon signs and loiterers, and guys passed out with whiskey bottles at their feet. Here's some whiskey. You'll hear cars and trucks driving by in the distance, you'll hear dogs barking, people arguing. It makes them feel like real locations. Some of the underground areas make use of pre-baked lighting to great effect, and it's really impressive stuff, especially for the time. It's just such a high amount of detail for an old graphics engine. 
I always really liked the design of these various bars that you head through too. It's kind of a lot like the cliche inns in an RPG where you chat to people to get your next mission. Hey, what's happening? Somebody turn on the lights. Stylistically, it's a combination of Art Deco with more modern architecture. So you'll see TVs and radios, but move through buildings where you'd expect to see Al Capone hanging out. It's a similar style of retro futurism to a game like Fallout, or again, Dishonored and some of the Wolfenstein games. Just makes the whole thing feel original as shit, and it separates it a lot from the other shooters we had at the time. It's also funny seeing this kind of realistic aesthetic with those wobbly Quake 2 engine character models. You can really see how Antonov took this same approach to the world building with Half-Life 2, and I think anyone who's played that game can attest to how believable and lived in a lot of those environments feel, and that's the same thing with Dishonored 2, which came out a decade or so later. All of those games just had these very detailed and gritty worlds for the player to explore, and it's kind of surreal seeing it in a game made in 1999. It's also kind of similar to Half-Life 1 in a way, in that you're not just moving from level to level, you're instead progressing through an actual world. You're on a journey instead of just hopping from map to map. When you enter a new part of the city, you'll see your character driving there on a motorbike or getting a lift from some poor asshole in a truck, who he promptly kills. It's a trend that started becoming a lot more popular around that same time, and even Quake 2 made this kind of shift as well. And of course, another shooter that ran on the Quake 2 engine, Sin. These are the games that all helped to shape the way we look at and play first-person shooters for years to come, and we owe it all to games like Kingpin. In fact, I think it kind of beats Half-Life at its own game in a lot of ways. How far do you want me to go with this? Half-Life was pretty linear, aside from a couple of chapters like Blast Core and On a Rail, but mostly it was just about moving onward towards the next area. In Kingpin, the game starts off and you're stuck in some shit-stained alley with no weapons or any idea of what you're supposed to be doing. You got a metal pipe which is about as useful as farting in someone's face and you just let off on your own devices. NPCs in the area react either positively or negatively depending on how you talk to them. What you'll eventually figure out that you need to do is wait until a bunch of nearby thugs are distracted by a baseball game on the radio. Then you sneak into a warehouse and steal a power coil from a storeroom. Which you then use to trade for a pistol at a nearby pawn shop so you can blast your way through the sewers. Hey, come back anytime, huh? Thanks for shopping, Pawnomatic. But along the way, you can also find the combination to a safe and get the cash inside. You can buy a crowbar for a dollar, which is a bit of a steal. All right, cool, here you crowbar. And even hire some muscle in the form of some big fat asshole who follows you around. This becomes a pretty common mechanic throughout the game, and as long as you've got the cash, you can pay anyone to help you out. With what cash is left over at this point, you can also buy a damage, reload, and silencer upgrade for your pistol as well. Now this is just in the first area of the game and this is all on one map. There's no loading screens interrupting any of this. I mean, in Half-Life in the Anomalous Materials chapter, you've got what, like five loading screens, if not more. Your objectives are literally find the HEV suit and get to the testing chamber. They're waiting for you, Gordon, in the test chamber. Now look, I'm not trying to shit on Half-Life, but my point is that Half-Life is often widely regarded as this kind of masterpiece of level design, which in a lot of ways it is, but whereas Kingpin barely gets a word in edgeways. And if you ask me, that's a damn shame. If you say Kingpin, people just think of that big fat bald prick from the Spider-Man comics, or that movie from the 1990s with Woody Harrelson. I saw that in the cinema too for a friend's birthday party. Sucked. So why didn't Kingpin get as well received? Well, there's a couple of reasons for this, and I think probably one of the biggest ones is that the game is kind of unbalanced. You've got five difficulty modes. You've got novice, easy, medium, hard, and realistic, but pretty much everything medium and up is just completely broken. Enemies just become absolute bullet sponges, and what doesn't help is that you can't really stagger them either when shooting them. About the only weapons that stagger them are the shotgun, heavy machine gun, and some of the tougher weapons like the flamethrower and the rocket launcher. But these aren't really going to help you early on in the game when enemies take 10 or more goddamn pistol shots before going down. Even later in the game, enemies with the Tommy gun will just absolutely shoot your shit to ribbons. From long range, they can just fire at you pretty much constantly, causing your screen to go bright red as your health falls off faster than your mum's panties do after I take her out for a seafood dinner. How the fuck are you so sure? I mean, in a game that feels super crushing to begin with, with that lack of guidance and direction of where to go and what to do, even though I find that appealing, gotta admit that this is the kind of stuff that's probably gonna turn off a lot of people before they've really got the chance to get into it. The other thing is that some of the weapons are good, but others are just a bit of an insult. 
I mean, outside of breaking crates for items, you'll pretty much never use the crowbar or the metal pipe. The pistol fires so goddamn slowly, I'm almost convinced it's a homage to the revolver in Redneck Rampage. It's got a silencer upgrade too, which you never even really need to use. It's instantly made redundant once you get the Tommy gun, which uses the same ammo but fires off a million rounds more a minute, with no recoil. It's like a goddamn laser. The flamethrower, a gun that you want to literally melt people with, just instead seems to stun people more than kill them. They run around with their hands up in the air like they're doing some kind of weird dance move. It's faster to swap to another weapon and just put them out of their misery than wait for them to die from the flames. Then there's the grenade launcher, which might be good, except the grenades aren't impact detonated. Now, I don't think I need to even explain why that's a bad thing. One of the later guns, the heavy machine gun, or the HMG for short, does pretty good damage, firing in three round bursts. But you've got to wait so long in between firing that you could go off and take a piss and come back before it's ready to go again. Once you get the cooling upgrade for it, it becomes a lot better, but it's still very ineffective against multiple opponents. As a result, the main guns you'll be using are the Tommy gun, the rocket launcher, and the shotgun. Probably not even the rocket launcher all that much, because rockets for this thing are so hard to come by at first. Still, it's not all that bad. I mean, they could have botched the shotgun, and in fact, I think this is probably one of the better FPS shotguns out there. And you'll get the odd dismemberment here and there from using this bad boy, which is just lovely. It can often take two or three point-blank shots, though, to kill enemies, which, for the so-called medium difficulty setting, is just kind of bollocks, and it really proves my point. You know what, the proof in the pudding as to how unbalanced this game is, is that one of the main things that 3D Realms are working on with this remake is the balancing itself. Shit! Lastly, I always had mixed feelings about the soundtrack in this game. Now, the soundtrack says that it's composed by Cypress Hill. But all this really means is that they've taken these four or five second loops from three of their more memorable tracks and just repeated it throughout the entire game. Yeah, three tracks. Count them. It was all a commotion. On top of that, these songs often play on radios throughout certain areas, giving you this kind of doubling up effect. Anyway, I think it makes the game more engrossing when you turn the music off, letting you appreciate the sound design even more. But hey, I mean, if you want to listen to a short loop of lightning strikes for 15 minutes straight, well, knock yourself out. Shit! Kingpin does start off a little bit more open-ended with all these various NPCs to interact with and all these objectives to complete. But after about two thirds or so into the campaign, it just turns into a pretty standard first person shooter. There's still some basic exploration and puzzle solving to be done, but nothing on the same level as to what you've been doing through the earlier levels. You don't really interact with NPCs all that much anymore outside of just murdering them. And you kind of be lining towards Marcellus Wallace to put him out of his misery. Spoiler warning, you get to kill him. Maybe you should have called in the wolf for backup. You sent in the wolf? Despite a lot of the issues this thing has, I still consider it to be a really unique shooter. And like all of the games released on the Quake 2 engine, it still plays really well. It's an early example of a game causing controversy for its mature writing and theme. And I honestly reckon it influenced a lot of other games that followed it. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if future titles like the Grand Theft Auto games, Manhunt, Kane and Lynch all took some kind of influence from it. The thing that's funny is that the only thing that's kind of legitimately adult about it is the profanity. The violence is about on par with any other shooter that came out around the same time period. You can jib enemies and they leave behind puddles of blood, but I mean, it's hardly worse than anything else at the time. It was a classic example of people just not knowing what the fuck they were talking about and looking for things to complain over. A subculture of journalism that still exists to this day. I guess my point is that if you're playing this expecting it to be like the antichrist of shooters, well, you might be a little bit disappointed. Unless you've got some kind of fetish for profanity, in which case you're going to cream your pants five seconds in. It's all got me looking forward to seeing how 3D Realms managed to tidy this one up. Fixing up the visuals and all of that is a bit of a no-brainer, but how they supposedly rebalance things to make it more accommodating and accessible is going to be really cool to see. Whether or not you choose to run the game through Steam or GOG, you can download a pretty easy to find patch, which makes the game run in widescreen along with a few engine modifications, like anti-aliasing and texture filtering. And it's really the best way to appreciate the game, short of this upcoming remaster. Son of a bitch got away. And if you've ever wanted to kill Marcellus Wallace, well, then this is the game for you.